Hello, my name is Yemna Vukabar, and the title of my presentation is The Identification of Soil-Borne Bacteria Capable of Antibiotic Production. So a little bit of background. Increasingly, antibiotics have begun to lose their effectiveness due to the growing amount of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Bacterial infections that were once easily treated with antibiotics can now be deadly. With, what, with six decades of rapid usage of antibiotics without consideration for their adaptive capabilities, bacteria, like any other organism, has the ability to adapt and resist. And medical community didn't take this into account when they use antibiotics for just about any infection they could. And then surprise, surprise, now we have this growing amount of antibiotic resistant bacteria. If not addressed immediately, this issue may worsen and a few years down the line, society might find itself in a mad scramble for some sort of solution. We must address this now. The identification for a novel antibiotic producing bacteria is crucial. So where might me, where might me start to look for such novel antibiotic producing bacteria? One source that is cheap, convenient, and found nearly everywhere is right in your backyard, the soil. Soil contains approximately 190 microorganisms per gram, and annually 500 novel bacteria are found per year. Moreover, the source for 80% of antibiotics is soil-borne microorganisms. So what better place to look than the soil? The question we sought to tackle today is, would we be able to isolate antibiotic producing bacteria from the soil? I hypothesized that at least one bacterial isolate capable of producing antibiotics would be isolated, but it would not be novel. So how are we gonna go about investigating this issue? There were variety methods utilized. First was soil sampling. Following Tiny Earth protocols, five to 10 grams of local soil from Frick Hall at California University of Pennsylvania was collected and soil sample conditions were documented, such as temperature, weather conditions of that day, et cetera. Next, the bacteria was suspended in sterile water so as to separate it from soil detritus, detritus and other organisms. The next method we used was serial dilutions. So a tenfold dilution via saline solution was performed on one gram of the suspended bacterial solution. Each subsequent diluted solution was added to a solid plate and colonies were left to grow until we had a diluted solution with, a, with countable colonies within that 30 to 300 golden range, um, making the measurement of cell density a, a very feasible task. And we use colony forming units or CFUs to estimate the number of bacterial cells in one gram of bacterial, in the one gram, gram bacterial solution. The next method we use is spread plate. plate. Basically, we wanted to acquire a spread plate with isolated colonies. To do this, sterile loops were used, collect bacterial cells, inoculate a section, on a labored agar plate using a zigzag motion. This was done for 12 sections, 12 colonies. We also used the pick and pat patch method where we took bacteria from a dilution plate, smeared it onto a master plate using a toothpick in order to isolate single bacterial species. Um, another method was colony morphology. So we took the colonies we, during their stationary phase of growth, the photograph was taken and then Observations were made for the following descriptors, color, texture, elevation, shape, and margin, or the edges. We also used selective and differential media. We used uh, two tests, the macron gate agar plate and the mannitol salt agar plate. And what we did is we, we had, for each of the mac, for each the macron key and the mannitol, we had two plates, one with five isolates and one with six. So a total of four plates. And we left them at room temperature for a period of 48 hours and then cut come the end of the 48 hours, we made our observations. And basically what we were looking for was growth or the absence of growth and the color. Growth on the mannitol plate would indicate gram negative, no, gram positive bacteria preferentially. However, gram negative bacteria could grow on mannitol if they could tolerate high salt. Growth on the Macronkey plate, however, would indicate gram negative bacteria. All the ways, gram positive bacteria cannot grow on that. Additionally, the colors we were looking for, for the mannitol, also known as MSA, if we saw yellow color, that would indicate bacteria capable of fermenting mannitol. 
um, red media or pink media would indicate bacteria that was not capable of fermenting mannitol. For the McConkey plate, on the other hand, red or pink media indicated bacteria that could ferment lactose, whereas yellow media or colorless would indicate bacteria that could not ferment lactose. So that's basically what we were, what we were looking for at the end of these 48 hours. We also had the two controls where we had a known gram positive and gr known gram negative, and we put them in these plates to see if these plates would actually tell us what we wanted to know, whether or not a bacteria was gram negative or gram positive. And then the last um, method we utilized was the spread patch antibiotic uh, screening. So we just conducted a spread patch test in order to screen for antibiotic producing bacterial isolates. So those are the methods we used. What did we find? Firstly, from the serial dilutions, we looked at the top row, plate number three was well within that golden range, it was at 32 colonies. And then the CFU calculated for it was 3.2 times 10 to the fifth CFU per gram. This means that in one gram of the bacteria that we took in the soil sampling stage, there's 3.2 times 10 to the fifth bacterial cells. Um, so this is a picture of our master plate during the stationary phase and basically a summary of the observations we made of the colony morphology. Most of the colonies, as you can see, were yellowish to whitish to cream in that color you know, range. We didn't have any outlandish colors. A lot of them were curled or undulate in their margin and all of them were irregular shaped. None of them were like a circle or an oval. They were all very irregular. Um, they were also all very shiny, glistening, like slimy kind of, except we did have a few that were like matte, not as shiny. And then another important thing to know is that colony three was contaminated. As you can see here, that's what this is here. That's colony three being contaminated. Um, so results of our differential and selective media. On the left here, we have the Matt Conkey plates. And on the right, we have the MSA or the Manitou plates. So I think the very first thing you see here when you see the, the MSA, the mannitol, is you see no yellow, it's all red. And this means we had no mannitol fermenters at all. However, interestingly enough, the Matt Conkey plate, we do see some red and some yellow here. And this red indicates that there were some lactose fermenters. Um, additionally, we had growth on both plates, meaning that there were some gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Uh, lastly, another important thing to note is our controls were not valuable. Moving on to the spread patch antibiotic production results. As you can see here, the only islet positive for antibiotic production was islet 11, and that was determined by growth. It was the only one that had any growth. None of these had any growth whatsoever. Uh, from that, we calculated our prevalence rate for master plate 13, it was 9.09%. And for the class data, our prevalence rate, rate was 3.24%. So what, what do all these numbers, what do these results mean? Well, first things first, from our CFU, that tells us in our original gram of soil, approximately 3.2 times 10 to the fifth bacterial cells. And we could, would not have been able to make this approximation were it not for the serial dilutions. I mean, imagine trying to count 3.2 times 10 to the fifth bacteria in a gram of soil, that's impossible. That's why we did the serial dilutions. Another thing is our class data had a lower prevalence rate um, than the master plate 13. So 9.99% for master plate 13 versus 3.24% for the class data. As you can see, 3.24 is significantly lower. And this might be because some of the other groups might not have to add any isolate antibiotic producing isolates. We only had one, some might have had none. And that would explain why the class data would have an overall lower prevalence rate. So what about our hypothesis? Well, the hypothesis is accepted in part because there was successful isolation of an antibiotic producer as predicted. However, whether or not this bacteria is novel, we can't really determine based on the experiments we conducted. We predicted it wouldn't be novel, but our, these experiments don't confirm that or not. That's why the hypothesis is only accepted in part. Additionally, these prevalence rate, what these prevalence rates tell us is that the soil is a feasible source for antibiotic producing bacteria, 9.09%. So as such, there is a clear need for crowdsourcing antibiotic discovery 
um, what do I think we should do next? From, from here, I think the most logical next step is determine was this isolate 11, was it a novel antibiotic producer? Because if it was a novel antibiotic producer, that could be potentially a new antibiotic and an antibiotic produ producing bacteria that has not yet had time to build up resistance which I think would be um, that bacteria have not had time to build resistance to, which I think could be very helpful for the medical community. Another step we could do is try meta to do metabolic identification, identify the metabolite, and what we could use to do that is mass spectroscopy. Overall, I hope this presentation has showed to you that the problem of an increasingly re antibiotic resistant bacteria is one we should care about, one that could significantly affect us if we do not address it immediately. And one possible place that we can go to for our answers is the soil. Thank you.